Welcome to the third lesson in our series on Paul's letter to the Philippians. Uh, the previous chapters are available here on YouTube if you need to catch up. And I'd also like to encourage you to make sure you have your Bible available with you tonight so you can read along. In the last chapter, we read about where we are to have the mind of Christ. Uh, Jesus Christ humbled himself coming to this earth from heaven and we are to humble ourselves too, taking up our cross and following him. And we are to put Christ and others above ourselves. And in chapter 2, we saw that he gave several examples of that. He gave the example of Christ putting others first and coming to earth and redeeming us. He gave his own life as an example. And then he spoke of Timothy and Epaphroditus as two other examples of what it is to put Christ and others first. Now today, as we prepare to delve into Philippians 3, we're going to pray based on what Luke 24, 45 says to us about Jesus' words. It says that he opened their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And that's my prayer for those of us studying this today. Father, we pray that you would open our understanding to the scriptures. We pray that you'd give us clarity of thought and mind, a heart to receive. As newborn babes, we would desire the sincere milk of the word that we might grow thereby. We are thankful, Father God, that you've given us, Lord God, your word. Your word is true, and you can speak to us by your word. And we thank you for your word. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, he begins with a strong word against false teachers. Well, here we have him beginning with this strong word against false teachers. He was not afraid to stand up against false teachers, false doctrine, and we don't want to be either. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. You didn't know that statement was in the scripture, did you? Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. See, that word beware is repeated three times. It's something that he, he's warning them very strongly. For we are the circumcision, which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Well, he starts off here by encouraging us to rejoice in the Lord. Joy and rejoicing are major themes in Philippians. If you have a concordance, and I hope you do, uh, if you don't have one when your budget allows, it might be a good tool for you to get for your Bible study. It's, it's simply a book that includes every word in the New and the Old Testament. So if you want to look up a particular word, uh, you can look it up and it will show you every time that word appears. Using that tool, you can look at Philippians and find that the words joy and rejoicing appear at least 14 times. Important concept. If the Apostle Paul could rejoice there in prison as he wrote this letter, the Philippians and you and I today should be able to rejoice in God ourselves with what we're going through. Now, he tells them he's repeating some things that he's maybe shared with them before, but he, he doesn't mean it to be grievesome, as he says here in the King James. But, you know, we might use the word tiresome or like a broken record. But his words were for their spiritual benefit, for their safety. You know, those beware, beware, beware. Those things were a safeguard. And we need those kind of scriptural safeguards today when we're faced with with the many false teachings that are out there today, because there is so much garbage in the world today. In giving them these warnings, he shows that he has the heart of a true shepherd. The pastor, the shepherd of the flock, is to feed the sheep, and he's also to protect them from spiritual wolves, false teachers, and false teaching. Jesus spoke of the difference between a hireling, a, a false shepherd, one who's just in it for what benefits him, and a good shepherd. And he said those differences would be obvious by their response to wolves. 
You see this in John 10, beginning at verse 11. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And every good pastor or good shepherd since then has sought to emulate the Lord Jesus. And I know that I fall far short, but that is the goal to, to give our lives, uh, not like Christ did dying on the cross, of course, but just to dedicate ourselves to seeing God's sheep, God's flock, growing in the things of God. But he goes on to say, he that is a hireling, that one that is just in it for what's in it for him, and not the shepherd whose sheep, whose own the sheep are not, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. So as we saw last week, the Apostle Paul was willing to pour out his own life to see the Philippians and others becoming what Christ intended them to be. Of course, not giving his life in the sense that Jesus did, but in a real sense, pouring out his life for the benefit of the flock of God. Paul gave himself for the sheep wherever he preached. He was not a hireling that ran in the face of danger to the flock. He was willing to stand up to the false teachers, the spiritual wolves, armed with the word of God, even though he knew sometimes that it might cost him greatly. But we know as followers of Jesus Christ that it's not just about me. It's not just about you. It's about Christ, first of all, and it's about others. It's about the family of God. He uses very strong language here against those wolves. He's not opposed to using strong language against false teaching elsewhere. If you remember from when we were in Galatians chapter 1, he says, If anyone comes preaching another gospel, another gospel than what you've heard me preach, he said, let him be anathema, let him be accursed, literally condemned to hell. Here are some of the names that he calls these false teachers. It's believed these were the ones we call the Judaizers. Those who are the ones who came in to these Gentile churches and said, unless you're circumcised, unless you follow the entirety of the law of Moses like we do, or they thought that they did, you can't be truly saved. You can't be truly sanctified. And Paul spared nothing in coming against this. He called them dogs. Dogs were not viewed as the beloved household pets in that time that they are today. They were something that was often despised. Uh, for that reason, Jews sometimes referred to Gentiles as dogs. And instead of that, Paul here is calling uh, these very pious, proper uh, converts from Judaism, the Judaizers, he's calling them dogs. And I'm, I'm sure that that really got them very irate. Jesus spoke about pigs and dogs together, two animals despised by the Jews. Uh, Matthew 7 and 6, give not that which is holy unto the dogs. Neither cast you your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. So like I said, very strong words against these false teachers, calling them dogs, those whom Jesus said, you know, you don't give something holy to dogs. Second, he called them evil workers. They believed they were the truly righteous ones. Yet Jesus made it clear that self-righteousness was no righteousness at all. And here Paul makes it clear uh, that they weren't truly the righteous ones. In fact, it was not a, just a case of wrong judgment. They were truly evil in what they were doing. This is serious business. And third, he calls them the concision. That is literally those who mutilate the flesh. This had to do with their insistence that these Gentile converts... Uh, in Philippi and other places, that they be circumcised and keep the entirety of the law if they are going to be truly close to God or even as a means of salvation. So he says, beware, beware, beware. Going back under the law is serious business. The false teachers believed that they were the ones who were truly close to God. They believed they were the ones that were doing the right thing, but their confidence was in their own flesh, something that will never do if we're going to be truly close to God. We must never put our confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. Our confidence is... Look at verse 3. For we are the circumcision. He's talking about the, the true believers, the, the true spiritual ones. 
We are the circumcision which worship Jesus or worship God in the spirit and we rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Now those spiritual dogs, the evil workers, those who insisted on thinking that mutilating the flesh was a means of getting closer to God, they were putting confidence in their own works of righteousness, their own flesh, and not really putting their confidence in the Lord at all. So who were the truly spiritual ones? Those were the ones who were truly doing the right thing, putting their confidence in God, putting their confidence in Him and not in their own fleshly works. We saw back in Ephesians 2, if we can boast about it, it's not biblical salvation. He said, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. And if you'll remember from the book of Galatians, we were told repeatedly how foolish it is to put our confidence in the flesh in our own good works. And, and I remember Galatians 3.3, 3, he asked, are you so foolish? Having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? Now, the true circumcision the New Testament scriptures tell us about is that of the heart. Not outward works, but a heart that has been changed through faith in Christ. We read about this in Romans 2. It says, for he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. In the spirit and not of the letter whose praise is not of men, but of God. A true born again relationship with God through Jesus Christ means a change of heart, not just outward man-made righteousness. You see, we are made righteous when we receive Christ. It is not our righteousness that makes us a child of God. The false teachers place great importance on their own works of righteousness, something that can never save us. It can never sanctify us. But if outward things could save us, Paul himself might have been a candidate. Because as far as the religious standards of that day, he had an amazing spiritual resume. An amazing spiritual resume. Now, it may seem like Paul is boasting here, but we're going to see he's not. He's trying to prove a point as he shares some of what I'm calling his spiritual resume. He says in verse 4, though I might also have confidence in the flesh. He's saying, you know, I, if you're going to talk about those who can have confidence in what they've done, let me tell you what I've done, what I've accomplished. Let me give you my spiritual credentials. And he had great spiritual credentials as far as human righteousness was concerned. He said, if any other man thinks that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I am more. He said, you know, you, you Judaizers, you false teachers, you think you're so righteous, you're so holy. Let me tell you a little bit about my life. He said, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So he's sharing his own spiritual credentials. He was the real thing, circumcised according to the command given in Leviticus 12, 3, on the eighth day of his life. And interestingly, that's the day when the clotting elements in the little baby boy's blood are at their high level. So his spiritual credentials began when he was just over a week old. He was a real thing, descended from the stock of Israel, he, his ancestry, his, his bloodline. You know, he could get on ancestry and trace his genealogy back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was the real thing, a member of the tribe of Benjamin, the tribe from which Israel's first king, Saul, had come. This was also his, his namesake, Saul Paul. He shared a name with that first great king. He was the real thing, a Hebrew of Hebrews. Not only was he a true Hebrew, his parents were too. He came from a long line. He was the real thing belonging to the strictest, quote unquote, denomination of the Jews, that of being a Pharisee. Their name means separated ones, and they sought to keep the letter of the law, and he was 
very careful in what he did and did not do. He was the real thing, so zealous for what he believed to be the truth that he was willing to persecute Christians before he was saved, thinking that he was doing God and his faith a favor. He was the real thing because he had gone as far as the righteousness that comes from the law could take him. So if anyone could possibly be saved by keeping the law, he would have been a good candidate. And of course, he would have gone on to say that even though he had all of those credentials, we're going to see they really didn't mean anything at all. Even though Paul had an amazing resume, he placed absolutely no confidence in it. Others might have, but he certainly didn't. He says in verse 7, But what things were gained to me, all of those things that were a part of his spiritual resume, those I counted loss for Christ, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. So others might have looked at all those spiritual qualifications that he mentioned and think, you've gained a lot in your life, Brother Paul. However, he made it clear those things that others might consider gain, he says, I really consider them as loss. In fact, he said, I count everything but my relationship with the Lord Jesus as a loss. There are profits and losses. And he said, all of those things that I used to think were so important. He says, I realize that the only real gain is my relationship with Jesus. And they ask him, what about those things you had to give up? Because you're following Jesus, Brother Paul. And he said, I count all those things but loss. They're nothing to me. They're so meaningless to me. Now in light of what I have in Jesus, I view them as dung, excrement, something that is thrown out. He says, my confidence is not in those things. My confidence is in the Lord. You see, church confidence in the Lord has been called the central theme of the Bible. It's kind of interesting that some have claim that the two central verses of the Bible are found in Psalm 118, verses 8 and 9. It's, Psalm 118 is kind of in an interesting spot anyway. It's between the shortest psalm, Psalm 117, and the longest, Psalm 119. But those two verses that are purported to be the central verses of the Scripture have to do with confidence in God. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. And then in Hebrews 10, 35, we're told that with confidence in the Lord, there's great promise of future reward. So whatever we have to give up for the cause of Christ, it's worth it. I love the words I heard an older Christian tell a new convert at his baptism. He told this young man that was being baptized, serving Jesus Christ will not always be easy, but it will always be worth it. And that's certainly true. Whatever you're going through today, serving Jesus Christ will not always be easy, but it will always be worth it for you. So in spite of Paul's impeccable religious qualifications, he knew that his righteousness did not come from great spiritual resume that he had, but through faith in Christ. Praise God forever. We're glad. Righteousness is not because of our good deeds. It's not because of our great qualifications, but it's through faith in Christ. Verse 9, he says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Isaiah 64, 6 makes it very clear that our best efforts at being righteous in ourselves, self-righteousness. They're described as filthy rags. Reminds me so much of what Paul said in the previous verses that all of those things that he had once thought were so important, he said, I now consider them as dung, garbage, something to be thrown away. You see, his righteousness was not self-righteousness, but faith righteousness. Something that he spoke about often in in other books, and other scriptures, Romans 10, for example, he said, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. 
For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. So there was a time in Paul's life when he went about trying to establish his own righteousness. But beginning at that point that he was saved on the road to Damascus, he had learned to submit himself unto the righteousness of God. You see, like Abraham, we believe God and it is counted unto us for righteousness. Romans 4, 3. When we believe, having saving faith, we are justified. Not only are our sins removed, but we are given the gift of his righteousness, right standing through faith. And he is making it quite clear here in Philippians 3 that aside from knowing Christ, nothing else really matters in the Nothing really matters but Jesus. He says in verse 9, and be found in him. Not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. So he said, if I can just be found in him, that's enough. And that's still enough to be in Christ. And if you've been through very many of these Bible studies, you know that that phrase in Christ or in him is, is so important. It's such an important spiritual truth in the New Testament. Jesus is enough. There's no greater pursuit than to know him, to know God. I remember my first weeks at Central Bible College many years ago. Sister Opal, Opal Redden gave us these words from Jeremiah 9 to memorize. They're the first scriptures that I can remember memorizing there in those days. Jeremiah 9, 23, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might, let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. So I want to be found in him, living in his resurrection power. And of course that is the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 11 says, If the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, and he does dwell in you if you're a believer... He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by the Spirit, His Spirit that dwells in you. That's the resurrection power. I want to be found in Him, and although that will likely mean suffering. Romans 8, 17, If children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, and we will, we may also be glorified together. I want to be found in him, although that may even mean giving my life, being made conformable to his death. This was a reality for Paul as he wrote this from Rome, shackled to a Roman soldier. And yes, indeed, history tells us that Paul did give his life as a martyr. I want to be found in him, knowing that just as Jesus rose from the dead, I will rise one day too. Though this body will die, possibly even a martyr's death, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead will quicken this mortal body too. In light of all of these things, I can't rest on what I've done, what I've attained. I can't rest on anything but Christ. And I must keep pressing on toward the mark, the goal, the finish line. Pressing toward the mark. I, I think that's a theme for this entire chapter. Verse 12 not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus. 
So Paul is saying, my goal is to be like Jesus. But I realize that I've not yet reached that goal. I have to say the same thing. My goal is to be like Christ, but I see how far short I fall of that goal. Though Paul was a great man of God, he was the first to admit his own weakness. He said, I've not reached full Christ-likeness yet, but that's my goal. That's what I follow after, even though I have not apprehended it yet. But until I reach that goal, I'm going to keep pressing toward that mark. Reminds me a lot of Hebrews 12, where we're running the race with patience. We're keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author, the finisher of our faith. And in this race, we cannot be continually looking back. We have to forget some things that are behind. And that would include all those former spiritual qualifications, those things that at one time we thought were gained, that were so important. And we must keep moving toward the goal, the mark, the prize. What about you? Are you pressing on toward that goal today? I trust that you are. And then he goes on to say in these next verses, Though we are not sinlessly perfect yet, we can still be mature Christians. He says in verse 15, Let us therefore as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Now we see here the same word, is used here, perfect, as in verse 12 with a different emphasis, at least in the King James translation. In verse 12, the word perfect speaks of having attained the fullness of Christ-like perfection. As far as that kind of perfection, Paul has not achieved that yet, and neither of you and neither have I. But here in verse 14, the word is more on the order of mature. And some translate it mature, and I, I think that gives us a better understanding we can be mature and still pressing toward the mark. We can be mature and still not sinlessly perfect. A two-year-old can be as mature as any two-year-old, but if they're still acting like a two-year-old at 10, something's wrong. So we are mature for where we are in our present walk with Christ, but we're still growing. We're still pressing toward the mark. And he says, if there are any among the readers who do not believe this, he says, I believe the Lord will reveal it to you. And as for the rest of us, whatever level we've attained in growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we must keep pressing on, keep running the race with patience, pressing toward that mark. And he's given us some good examples to follow. He says, no, we're not yet perfect, sinless, but we're following a good example. Jesus, of course, is, is our great example. We follow him. But Paul places some other godly examples before us too. Listen to verse 17. Brethren, be followers together of me. Man, that's a strong statement to make, isn't it? And mark them which walk so as you have us for an example. He says, follow me. This is not the first time that he encouraged others to follow him. We find another instance in 1 Corinthians 11, 1. Where he says, be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. As long as I'm following Christ, you can follow me. If you see that I'm not following Christ, then don't follow me. So what example, what pattern of his life are we to follow? And we're to follow him as he in turn kept his eyes on Jesus and kept pressing toward the mark. And he tells us that there will be others that cross our path. Others that if they're following that same example, if others are following Jesus and pressing on toward the mark, we can follow their godly example too. So we praise God today for godly examples and we pray that God will help us to be godly examples as we press toward the mark ourselves. Well, there are not only godly examples, but there are other examples that are not so godly. So we're not yet perfect, but we shun those evil examples. I believe he's referring here back again to some of these false teachers among the, the Judaizers. He says, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping. You know, he's, he's warning them so strongly. He's got tears in his eyes as he writes these things and as he warns them 
He says that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. He says these are the ones you don't want to follow. You can follow me so long as you see that I'm following the Lord Jesus Christ. There are other godly men and women you can follow so long as they're following Jesus and pressing toward the mark. He said, here's some you don't want to follow. So those who tell you that you can be made righteous through their, your own good works are enemies of the cross. That's a strong statement. But you know, it, it's true. If, if I could be made righteous through the law, through keeping the law or my own good works, the cross would have been such a waste. And I would become an enemy of the cross. I want to be a friend. He says, those who lead you astray, they may seem to prosper now, but in the end, they will face destruction. You know, we might think of some of the cults today, and some of the cults are growing. Some of the false religions are growing. Growth is, is no standard by which to measure if something's right or wrong. Ultimately, destruction will come to those who preach another gospel. He says their God is their belly. In other words, they're just in it for what's in it for them. Uh, they're not putting others first, as we're called to do here in Philippians. Self-serving. And those things that should bring them shame are what they are glorying in. They should be ashamed of how they're truly living, but instead they're, they're puffed up by how well they think that they're keeping the law. Glorying in their own righteousness, these things should not be. And they claim to be so truly spiritual, so truly heavenly minded, but in reality their minds are on earthly things. Colossians 3, 2 tells us that we are to set our affection on things above, not on things on the earth. So we are to follow godly examples and shun evil examples, and we are to live citizens of heaven. Verse 20, for our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The word conversation here in the King James means citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. We don't live like the false teachers who in the previous verse were said to mind earthly things. Instead, we live as those who are citizens of Christ's heavenly kingdom. We live that way anticipating something. We anticipate, we look for the return of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ from heaven one day. You know, the Bible says he's coming back for those who look for him. And when that day comes, we will be made perfect. His work will be complete in us. Verse 21, it says he will change our vile bodies. Who will change our vile bodies that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. We're going to have a glorified body like Christ has. According to the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things unto himself. 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that all of that will happen in the twinkling of an eye. You know, up to this point, we're, we're still plodding along, pressing toward the mark, making progress. But ultimately, his work in us will be complete. That perfecting in us, that which we're pressing toward, will be realized when we see Jesus. 1 John 3, behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. That we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. Let's pray. Father, at the very beginning, we prayed that you would open our understanding to the scriptures. We pray that you have done so. We pray that you'd help us to take those things that we're beginning to understand, that we're beginning to grasp, and help us to go with them and to grow with them. Help us, Lord God, to know what it is to follow you. And Lord God, we realize that we're not perfect yet, but we are pressing toward the mark. And when we see Jesus, his work in us will be complete and we can rejoice in him forever and ever. Bless those who listen to this lesson today and in the days ahead. Draw them closer to Christ than they've ever been before. Give them a hunger and a thirst for the word of God. 
that word which according to John 17, 17, will purify them, sanctify them. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, what about you? Do you like to sing? Do you like some of the old hymns of the faith? I'm no singer, and, and you may feel like you're not either, but the Lord tells us to lift up our voices and make a joyful noise. There's an old hymn that came to mind this week as I was preparing this lesson. It's entitled Higher Ground. So why don't you, wherever you are, just join with me. Let's lift up our voices together. Make a joyful noise to the Lord as we sing about leaving behind those things and pressing toward the mark. And moving on toward that higher ground in Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us continue to press on to that higher ground in Jesus. Amen.